So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to talk relatively quickly because there's an enormous amount of stuff to cover. Um, so if I become completely unintelligible, let me know. I'm also using this microphone because you seem always to be able to hear this one, and that one seems a little crunky. So um, uh, what I'm hoping to talk through today is two brief examples uh, that I worked on personally in the last year, uh, helping customers build big stuff. Uh, and by customers and partners and sort of downstream users, uh, what I'll show is some incredibly tiny teams, little, little groups of people, two people in one case, seven people in another case, uh, building systems that serve millions of users. Uh, and we'll talk through that um, based on the Curiosity rover Mars landing that happened uh, uh, in the middle of the year last year, uh, and the Obama for America election process in the United States. So um, both of those systems, large, complicated, uh, and I'll talk through how they're built, uh, how they scaled, how big they got, uh, what technologies were used, what technologies were avoided, and probably most importantly, the things they learned that hopefully you can take advantage of and build in ways that are useful and intelligent and don't cause problems. So. Uh, as a matter of caveat, that's relatively important. As a part of the election process in the United States, it's very critical that I didn't do a whole bunch of stuff for them for free. So Amazon does not support any specific political candidate. And when I was there, I was on vacation. So uh, I also fit in with this group of weirdos because I'm an electric sousaphone player. Um, and you'll see why that's important later. So um, first example, the uh, NASA JPL stuff. Um, uh, JPL's in Pasadena, which is down the street from my house. So it made sense that I would go help. Uh, they had this kind of interesting challenge. They're, uh, they're going to land a Mar uh, basically a Mini Cooper with uh, lasers on its head um, uh, on Mars, some however many bazillion miles away. Uh, and they're going to live stream that event. So not actually the video footage of something that's happening however many bazillion miles away, because that's relatively low bandwidth. Um, but the TV that NASA produces, the video of the people in mission control and the stats and changes that are happening inside of that system, uh, they think that that's going to be a 1080p stream. That's their goal. They want to present it to museums and iPads and TVs and every other different kind of device. Uh, they think they're going to have about a million users. And if any of you are doing the math, that's 8 terabits a second of video. Um, uh, they also want to make sure that that doesn't crash ever at all. No packets dropping, no frames bad. This is history. Can't screw this up. So uh, that stuff's all fun. This is the part that's not so fun. Um, uh, we can't use any of the tools from NASA. NASA says, sorry, peace out, JPL, you can't have our stuff. Uh, we also have six days' notice. Uh, they, they sent this thing two and a half years earlier, uh, but they only figure out the live streaming bit the week before. Um, uh, it's also exactly the same week as the Olympics. So I don't know if you know anything about how Olympics uses video, but basically every CDN is toast. Um, and we have exactly two technical resources, Brett and Quadra. Brett and Quadra. So th those two dudes uh, are, are confronted with this sort of sticky wicket, this broken bit of the way live streaming works today, which is the video is giant, typically four megabyte chunks. They don't ever, ever change. Uh, they cache like cake. It's super simple to throw them in whatever different kind of caching setup you want. The manifest, this little tiny 4K file, changes all the goddamn time. And it's impossible to cache because you don't want to keep the old version. That's the one that points to the old video. You want to keep the new version. So caching this re relatively rapidly changing file is very complicated. And they have to happen basically in the same place. Otherwise, all sorts of odd timing things happen and it gets crappy. So uh, the plan is uh, let's design a solution that deals with the complexities of live streaming without the advantages of any of the pre-built systems for live streaming. Ooh, that's fun. So. Um, uh, we also have this uh, really, really uh, intense compression around uh, uh, latency that's available, right? We need each of the different uh, museums and the different users around the United States and, in fact, around the world to be able to see this video. That's the whole reason that you have these big distributed systems, um, but we, we can't use any of them. So uh, how do we build one of these from scratch? Um, and we have two guys. So uh, we've got to do this quick. The advantage being that one of those guys is a rocket scientist, literally an actual rocket scientist, so we have some advantages. Um, <laughs> What, what they end up building is, uh, and we designed, is called the 42 pack. Uh, conveniently, 42 is the answer to the universe and everything. It also is how you live stream video. So um, you take one Telestream Wirecast server, uh, 
hanging on to a Mac Pro that's sitting in JPL NASA. That serves to Adobe Flash Media servers that cache their video and their manifest file to an Nginx cache server, which cannot accept enough connections to scale big enough, so you need another tier of caching. And then Amazon's load balancers. All of this gets packaged inside of a cloud formation script. That's our template for packaging Amazon resources into a deployable single atomic unit. If any part of that deploy fails, it rolls the whole thing back. So the result is this whole stack of stuff, by our estimation, uh, will do 25 gigabits a second of video. So what we're expecting them to be able to do is start up as many stacks of this as they need to deploy as much video as they need. So we test it. We grab guys from Soasta. They spew vomit 10 million concurrent virtual users at the output of this system, uh, just looking at the little 4K manifest file. Uh, and right at 25 gigabits a second, we top out. If they go to 27, we take a dive and errors go all Mac crazy. So we know that our estimate was relatively good. So uh, that load balancing system is serving something like, oh, that's right, 25 gigs a second. Uh, that's what it looks like when you dump in however many million concurrent users. And the back ends have been protected. This is measurements for network output on the FMS, that's Adobe Flash Media Server. That's only 42 megs a second, also 42, interesting. Um, <laughs> so uh, so that, that means that our caching is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, uh, and all of it worked. Uh, not just the part where the video streamed, but in fact, uh, the whole crazy science of them actually landing the rover and not crashing the thing. Um, all that stuff did what it was supposed to do. Um, an interesting couple of learnings from this project, right? So uh, this whole team, these two guys, relatively terrified, right? You're on an incredibly short time scale, um, but being able to test, even just the day after we wrote this little chunk of Nginx code and this little chunk of cloud formation code and this little chunk of FMS configuration code, being able to test at scale made everybody take a deep breath and say, awesome, this is not going to suck. We are not going to get kicked in the face by the president. That is rad. So, um, so the other piece was uh, we, we turned this into a little bit of a game. Since we've already tested it two days in, now we just want there to be a giant green button on the website that you hit, and that turns on another 25 gigs a second of network bandwidth. So they were stabbing this button basically for fun on the actual go day um, <laughs> because they're going to need a lot of those buttons pushed. Uh, another thing that was interesting, this is, um, this is a kind of a painful bit. We did all of this evaluation and engineering and analysis around the stack uh, and made the video system work without dropping a frame. All the metrics that we had built on it showed high success rates. Everything was doing what it was supposed to do. The wrapper around the web page that shows the video is in a CMS. And that CMS is on a database backend. <laughs> and, that, and, and, that, and that database is a, a very small database. <laughs> so uh, at the last minute, we identify this thing and go, ooh, uh, and, and uh, made that uh, 16 times bigger, let's say. So, uh, so not only can you scale in advance, but you can kind of scale as an emergency. Uh, and as a result, we didn't break a bunch of stuff. In fact, uh, NASA.com and uh, I think MarsRover.com, both NASA-owned properties run on physical hardware, failed that evening and loaded over onto our system because everybody just wanted to see the video anyway. And we held all that traffic too, just for fun. So um, <laughs> the interesting bit of all of that is uh, it's not, e here's, the, 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 every time I say this, it makes my skull explode. So the, the video in high def, viewed by hundreds of thousands of concurrent people, all of the data, the sum of them, which is a number that I cannot share with you, uh, this is the 17K image that was the first file sent from space from the Mars rover back over the deep space internet network and directly to S3, put in an S3 bucket, and then served from S3 to everyone. This 17K file served more data than the video stream. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> right? So, so sometimes, does, it's not just about big files or big objects, sometimes volume really is important. Uh, S3 took exactly zero configuration, zero updates, zero patches, zero new files. You put the file in it and you kick the URL out and it just sort of does what it's supposed to do. So um, that rocks. It was awesome. Um, uh, currently, I haven't played tuba at JPL yet. I'm hoping for your votes. Uh, I'd love to go down there and uh, make noises the next time they launch something in space. Uh, that's me and my crazy electric shoes. So, um, 
Another project, also interesting, hopefully uh, something that you'll like. Um, let's, let's imagine we're going to go elect a president. Um, what we're probably going to have to do is raise a lot of money. Um, so much money, in fact, that we're going to build the 30th biggest e-commerce system in the world. We're going to raise over a billion dollars. So that means we actually have to commit the transactions of processing payments of a billion dollars. That all by itself is a complicated, big, awful thing to build. Uh, we're also going to build 200 distinct applications, totally different pieces of software. So one iPhone application and its data backend and the metric system and the monitoring that applies on that, that's one. They build 200 of those. We'll talk about what those look like. Uh, on top of that, they have 50 full-time query analysts looking at hundreds of terabytes of data trying to figure out what's going on in the election. So we're going to need to write a lot of SQL, and we're going to need a data system that can handle that. We're, we're also uh, looking at a, a system where anytime the president even remotely looks in the general direction of a website, a million people come to it, totally unexpectedly. Uh, without any kind of form notice, and as a result, any one of these individual applications is under a relatively incredible degree of load. Also, that is super fun. Uh, what is not fun is when you have no money to do so. Uh, every dollar that you spend building this thing is a dollar you're not spending electing the president. Um, you also have about seven months and nearly three quarters of the organization is volunteers. So nights and weekends developers. You can't bring someone in and they say, well, I develop in Java. You say, go home. No, you say, go sit with the Java guys and build something interesting. So you have, you have this, everybody here has been talking like Node.js. You don't like it? If you get a volunteer who's on Node.js, you send him over to go build something. Like, that's the deal. Uh, uh, you also have exactly one release day. There's only one day that's important, and you need an act of Congress to change the date. How many of you, <laughs> right? I mean, like, I, I don't ever ship code on time. How many of you have never missed a release date? Like, there can't be any hands up, right? Like, so, so there's, you, it's just a very complicated situation, so, uh, and it's built by crazy people. Um, so uh, I've done a sort of straw poll, and the average developer in this organization is six years younger than the average one of you. 23 years old is the average dude. The guys running ops are the old smelly ones. I'm the old guy in this <laughs> setup, right? So uh, that's the CTO. He was at Twitter. He, we just hired him. He's now at NASA. We just hired him too. A uh, bunch of smart guys. Um, and and they're, they're working in a crazy madhouse, right? Like, uh, makes your startups or college dorms look clean and tidy. Uh, there's posters and snot and beer and whatnot all over the place. Um, also, relatively interesting high bar participants. Uh, that's Eric Schmidt from Google. That's me. Um, that, that's, that, back here is a refrigerator full of cheese. So um, they, they built this huge series of applications. Again, 200 distinct applications. A couple examples. So uh, this is Canvas. You can see the little map dots. So uh, in the United States, you must register to vote. Registration is a simple form, but it's different for every state. Registration has to happen before voting, and there's a certain number of days that it happens, has to happen early. So if you're a volunteer who wants to introduce yourself to people and say, hey, why don't you come register to vote? It's going to be great. Fill this form out. You probably don't want to knock on the door of someone who's already registered to vote, because that's going to be kind of obnoxious. So the database that updates that data is updated only once a week. That's not so good. So what Canvas does is figures out where you are, figures out the closest people who haven't already registered, sends you a map that shows you where to walk, and updates the places you should knock based on if you've tweeted whether you registered, if you posted them on Facebook that you registered, if you went to their website and said, I love registering, it's the bomb, right? So that's, that's one application. They built 200 of those, right? So they built their own copy of Facebook an internal system to share pictures and messages between groups to build friends inside the volunteer set. They built a thing called Call Tool. You turn this app on on your phone, and your phone just starts ringing. The next person that's on the phone is the next most important person for us to talk to to ask for them to volunteer or donate money. And your phone will never stop ringing until you turn the app off. Right? And that's optimized, tuned. Every phone call is the correct, most important next phone call to make. So, uh, they built all this stuff and it all worked and he won, so woo! Um, uh, 
they also had a gazillion charts that monitored and measured this thing. I could show you all of them. They all look exactly like this. They're all a you know, sea of pain as you get to the actual election day. <laughs> so uh, it's also relatively big. This is Scott. He's the lead engineer. He designed and built most of the architecture. Uh, and he has all these terrifying numbers like eight and a half billion requests that get processed and things like that. So how do you do this? We talked to them relatively early on. Uh, and they thought about using Amazon. It would be great. They'll buy computers from us. We'll even ship them out free. Um, uh, and they, and, but they were concerned that maybe they would have too many orders or that Thursday wouldn't be soon enough or they wouldn't know exactly how many to do. So they actually sent us an email and said, we don't want to spend any money at all. Uh, and, 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 and if we do have to pay for something, we only want it to be for stuff that we use. And, and no provider is ever going to be fast enough. You guys are too slow. I can't wait for a phone call. A phone call takes too long. You have to give me some kind of computery thing that makes it so that this stuff gets fixed without your help. We, we said, that's called an API. So, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, they also wanted it to scale up and down because when the election is done, they all go home. There is no more job. You are all done. You either you win or you lost and you go away. So they'd like the servers to do the same thing. They spent over a year in 2008 just getting rid of the servers. So. Um, the, the time to market is relatively critical because they've got to get stuff started. So they told us that. So we built this. This is a live website. You can all go there. It works great. I even tried it here in South Africa. By gum, it actually loads. Uh, and, uh, and it's impossible to read at this scale, so I will show you a little bit of what it looks like. So this is a little zoomed in, but you get an idea of what we're looking at as you zoom out, right? Oh, mother of lord. <laughs> well, I want that button. And this button. And then I want, oh, this is going to be so hard. And that button. And then just goes and goes and goes and goes. So each one of these little blinkety dots is an EC2 instance, so they had a few of them. Um, I'll go back to this thing. Yes. Okay, so a couple of important spots on it. Uh, every website and basically every one of the major systems follow normal AWS and frankly everywhere else best practices. Have multiple machines, distribute work across them, put that work into queues, put those data from queues into databases, read that data back out into pre-computed views, answer questions with that data and go home and park. Um, uh, you also have very, very giant data analysis systems. So. Uh, uh, over here, a uh, SQL data store, 28 terabytes, 526,000 IOPS of query performance, about uh, a terabyte of memory. Um, uh, and then when this became too complicated, they just did it all in Dynamo with a couple of lines of code. Um, that's 200,000 IOPS. Uh, and they had 11 different subsets of this, and I'll talk about why that is. Um, they also, and probably the most important part of what they designed and what we helped them design, uh, is a system called Narwhal. Narwhal is an API for abstracting all back-end data services that the Obama team does not own, right? So processing payments, collecting map data, voter registration information, there are about 100 of these different things. If each of the different applications down here have to implement integrations against those back-end services, one, they will overload most of them. Uh, the, Voter registration database runs on a two-core machine from 2004 in a data center in DDC, so um, you can't run web apps off that. So uh, what they did do is run almost every conceivable piece of software, um, uh, and it's impossible to read this thing. And, and the reason is largely because of that diverse developer group that's mostly volunteers. If you say, I'm going to take the store and I'm going to build it in Magento, and that means we've got to have you know, servers up front that'll handle MySQL and, and memcache for caching. Great, you're in charge of building that stuff. Go off and get it done. So uh, that means you're talking about every one of the basic structured data storage options that there are is someplace in this thing, right? Level DB, sure, or Postgres, absolutely. Elastic Cache, Vertica, RDS, all these different systems. Uh, every one of the basic development frameworks. There. You have single applications that have portions that are PHP and other portions that are Rails and other portions that are Node, right? So they were worried when they approached the problem this way. They were actually very terrified in all these sort of dark gray areas. Like, 
our operations will be so scary, we will never get things done. And oh man, uh, it will be so fragile, everything will break, and our developers will never be able to figure out how to use a queue or SOA. Um, but the upsides of those choices uh, made it so that everything worked. They just would have been broken if they weren't able to scale in the way that they did. So, um, and they had no time, zero time, to get any of this stuff done. So in a lot of cases, anything that they could consume as a service, they did. There were huge numbers of partner services that they used. They also used a lot of the aggregated services from AWS. So um, in each one of these instances, they looked at the software alternates. I, mean, they know, I know how to run HAProxy. It's not complicated. You install it on software. But when you choose to install HAProxy rather than running a managed load balancer like ELB, you are choosing to spend focus and expertise and time and research and money and risk tolerance and staff and dedication to innovation and blah, 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 which makes it really, really difficult to get stuff done, right? Because you have 200 applications to build. That means each one of these becomes a very important application you're off building and monitoring and managing that probably you put your hardest core best developers on rather than building the net new interesting things that most customers want. So a great example of this, I am the author of the MongoDB on EC2 white paper. I know how to use Mongo. I think it's a spectacular product. Uh, it is 14 steps to install Mongo on EC2. That's what my paper says. So I've raced and I can do it in six and a half minutes if I click real fast. And if I put it in CloudFormation and write it into a script, I can get it done in about five minutes because computers are a little faster than my fingers. But in Dynamo, in eight minutes, you can insert uh, 1.7 gigs of data, right? And be done and never have any setup and no multi-node machine and no complicated thing. It's not to say that it's better or worse. It's different in that it's faster to get started right away and it scales to a degree that most folks can't implement on their own in that kind of time frame. So uh, there are also other kinds of things that you can't plan for. This is a picture of the weather 11 days before the election. This is where our data centers are. That is too close. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the head of the campaign, the total all up owner of the campaign sent us this cake. Um, uh, and, and, we, and we really, we really wanted to eat the cake, right? We did not want to censor this up. And so, uh, so the worry was that we built this whole part of the chart, which is all in the US East, um, uh, in which uh, you know, a, an unbelievable fraction of the internet exists today. Um, and so it, this system took us a long time to put together. We used Puppet to pre-build configurations. You'd run Puppet and execute and build those machines, save them as Amazon machine images, add them to auto-scaling groups so that you can grow and shrink an infrastructure in a way that happens at any kind of reasonable rate of speed. Um, but we're really worried about how long is it gonna take for us to get out from here and go someplace over there, which is on the west coast of the United States, right? So uh, what we did is we used Asgard and Puppet together to build the version in the west coast in about nine hours, which is about 560 instances. We moved about 28 terabytes of the most critical data over using Tsunami UDP and CloudOps. Um, and so you can do that. Like your applications, your systems, even smaller scale than this happens faster than this. Like, this is absolutely doable stuff with, again, 22-year-old college kids, guys on vacation, up, up on a weekend, right? Uh, it also requires a fantastic amount of caffeine. I um, <laughs> uh, cannot stress enough the importance of having a drawer loaded like that. Um, another really critical bit that they did is this idea called game day. So uh, Saturday, tomorrow, we're gonna have a, a little bit of a play session. Uh, uh, two different four-hour windows where I'll lead an architecture training class. Um, we'll go through and build a batch processing architecture that's very similar to a part of a processing pipeline that's in the Obama campaign. And we will do what they did, which is called game day. So they would take their team, and let's imagine their team is as big as this room, which it was not as many times smaller, but let's say all of you guys on this side, you're the bad guys. And all of you on this side, you're the good guys. And the bad guys get IM keys that allow them to access a copy of production and you can destroy whatever you want. So you're like a living, breathing version of the Chaos Monkey from Netflix, right? You can, <laughs> you can do whatever kind of evil, sadistic stuff you want. Ooh, I'm gonna delete SQS keys or oh, I'll detach EBS volumes for fun or I'm gonna log in and I'm gonna delete all the SSH keys or you know, whatever kind of nasty things you wanna do. Then this team, the good guys, your job is fixing it. And, and, 
and you both get bonus points, right? If you come up with some extra sneaky, nasty, ruthless, brutal, brutal way of breaking systems, they actually come over and high five you because that's cool. And, and the good guy's side, if you say you use automation to fix the problem, that's kind of kudos, that's kind of awesome. Um, there's also a subgroup over here that's taking lots of notes. So that when you actually break something for really reals on the real day, you know what the heck you're supposed to do. And it's especially important when you're talking about like junior developers or first time or second time folks, you get a little terrified when you're in front of the website for the president. And so you don't, you, you want to make sure that they have like a clear set of steps that you can follow to not uh, bone themselves. So uh, another super important, super, 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 super critical design pattern. I, we've heard a lot about RabbitMQ today. Uh, I don't know if I'm a particularly big fan of non-durable queues. That's confusing to me. Um, but they did loosely couple like crazily. So you can think about this like having a clutch on your applications. You really like, how many people drive a stick shift without their clutch? I've, it can be done, you just have to be really precise, right? So the most, most application developers that I know are not that precise. In fact, they go, ah, we gotta update the database, hold on a second, right? And so I'll give you an example. Um, during the vice presidential debate, when we were earning $400,000 a minute in donations, we had a major release that included security patches to the primary database holding these transactions. So we're thinking about that and saying, we're earning money and we're gonna turn the database off. Is this really a good idea? <laughs> so, uh, but what we were able to do, because we're loosely coupled, because there's a queue in way, and because we know how long the transactions to take, and because we've done a game day so we know exactly how long it takes to run a patch, we do it right in the middle of the debate, we pull the primary database down, fold over, everything works how it's supposed to work, millions of dollars aren't lost, everybody goes on and parties. So uh, another important pattern, another model there is called failing forward, failing forward rocks. So these guys were in a high pressure, high intensity uh, environment. And so rather than saving a safe version of the code, they'd already done all of the work to prioritize the right features in the right applications to choose the important things to build. So everything that was on the list to get built, it's critical, it's mission critical, it's important, it will likely elect the president, right? You've gotta get this stuff done. You've also built all of this loose coupling in, so if something that you build breaks, it probably won't screw anything else up. That's really the whole goal of the design. So if you bust something, you do not roll back. There is in fact a no process for rolling back in their CI or their CD, right? What you do is you sit there and you fix it until it works. You just stay up late. And so it creates this totally different culture around development, right? One, you're a little more conservative in terms of you don't want to you know, just push out totally trash code. But the other side of it is you're also, uh, you're kind of building the team camaraderie. Everybody has screwed up at least once, so everybody has the kind of relationships required to double invest and triple invest and make sure things get done. So another super important pattern uh, is high availability and depth. Everybody talks about well, my, my software is totally highly available. I've got it distributed across multiple instances. But if instances everywhere, all of them fail all up, you're not very highly available, are you? So uh, these guys wanted to build high availability in at multiple tiers. So they wanted to assume whole products would fail. They wanted to assume that whole software stacks would fail. So part of this they already had built in because they were across multiple languages. So if all of Java ceased to be secure and there's doom everywhere, which is true, um, <laughs> that, then the tiny parts of their system that were built in Java, they could just decide to rebuild in something else that represents a subset, not the entire footprint of the production system, right? So they have this heterogeneous diversity that allows a kind of defense in depth. They also spent a whole bunch of time making it so that basically every single page uh, would dump as a static copy to S3. They even went so far as to having every one of the DNS records fail back to an S3 object in a different bucket from a different account that just said, go register, go vote, and tell your friends to vote. So if everything else blows up, at least just get, get out there and vote, right? So, um, so what Mr. Obama would like you to do first is come help us do stuff like this. Uh, Amazon is hiring, there's my plug. Um, uh, uh, and uh, when I started, two and three quarters years ago, I had never used the cloud. And I got to do this. So I'm telling you there's a lot of fun things to do. Uh, you also can read some of their code, which is kind of dope. 
Um, uh, this is a Rails application for voter registration. Um, shows kind of their code style and their patterns. They're looking at taking more of the code layers and open sourcing them. Um, you also can read a book uh, that got published on some weird bookseller online. Um, and uh, what it talks through is specifically the game day process, that, uh, that pattern for helping people anticipate and, and uh, look through problems and build those problems. Uh, questions? Thanks. I am the only one with the mic. <laughs> so either Jonathan has to steal the mic and I shout, or you shout your pick. You mentioned something about rabbit in queue and a non-variable queue. Can you tell us a bit about that? A non-durable queue. So uh, rabbit in queue does not tolerate uh, multiple node or multiple location redundancy in storage or in, you know, on disk. I want persistence in my in queued messages. I consider them precious. And SQS is deeply durable. It's designed in the same model as S3. So um, many, many copies in many data centers. Okay, uh, we're here in South Africa and um, we're maybe a little bit more price sensitive than the average US startup. Um, when you give people a big green button to just keep deploying more instances, uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the thought that goes into planning what all of this is gonna cost after the big event is over? Sure, every CloudFormation script when launched in our console drives to a simple calculator it shows you exactly what it will cost to run that entire stack for a month. So you have a relatively good idea of what they're gonna cost if you run them for a long time. Conveniently, for the NASA example, they ran them for four hours or so. So being able to scale up to hundreds of nodes costs the same amount as one node for hundreds of hours, right? So they are able to really, very accurately, they were within 10% of their estimate, I think it's gonna be like this, to what actually their bill ended up being. Um, many workloads that spike like that take deep advantage from cloud offerings because there's this kind of natural on-demand payment model, uh, particularly at our grain, uh, which is supplemented by spot instances. So in this case, they used on-demand, um, but you could easily have replicated what they did in the spot market, which runs today steady state something like 10% of the on-demand rate. Um, if your workload is a different shape, if you're gonna run something steady state for longer, there are parts of the Obama architecture where they use reserved instances to buy down the rate so that you can even run it here. In the back. With re considering you guys had volunteers, right? How did you structure your resources, like human resources, who was in charge of everybody is just kind of, how did that work? Sure, so um, there was a drinking test. <laughs> Uh, and then your choice of cheeses. It was, there was a high bar for like, are you a blue cheese man, are you a camembert? Um, uh, the, tip, the structure basically worked where there was a DevOps core team that was in charge of the machines and built the Narwhal API, the central data service that all downstream applications use. So that system is built by the sort of smellier old guys that look funny. Uh, and, uh, and has a higher bar for uh, code test coverage and sort of complexity and, and fault tolerance in the deployment. The downstream applications are stack ranked and there are subsets of a technology team or the development org that builds each of those. They're, they're responsible end to end for the operations of their app, but they don't, the hardest parts of their application are handled centrally by this big API. So, those downstream groups are organized by, basically by programming language and meritocratously they go through and figure out who the smartest guy or gal is. Uh, for the ladies in the room, Carol Davidson built uh, an optimization engine for TV ad placement that saved the campaign $260 million with her and two gals. So um, ladies kicked some butt in this campaign. 
Um, uh, but the, the, team, uh, the team broke up development typically by having full stack developers for their app unit, not like a database team and an app team and a web team. They built the whole piece for their little app. Because there were, if you think about the number of days in seven months, there were, there's almost an app a day that you're trying to build. Uh, sorry, with things like JPL, where you were planning on literally kind of spiking for four hours hugely, were you not concerned that you might exceed the capacity of the spot market? So um, we had Charlie Bell, the head of engineering on site, because uh, he wanted to see it land. Um, and we asked him real nice to give us lots of computers. Um, <laughs> but, but we also, um, we, we built this system internally uh, that all customers have access to that's called a limit increase, right? You ask us about how many machines you want, your spot instances are a multiple of that access. Spot instances are not made available or unavailable because we think it's fun, it's, it's other customers consuming those resources. So, and if they consume them, what they're doing is they're raising the price. So you can actually defend against consumption by bidding a lot for machines. Uh, the typical, there are lots of different patterns, I have a whole hour long presentation on cost optimization, but. Um, but typically what you're looking at is identifying what's the minimum footprint for your application running that in on demand or reserved and then any bonus capacity that stuff sits in spot. Any more? So since the developers were all uh, volunteers, how did you stop undercover Republicans from coming in <laughs> and putting a little Easter egg in a code to scuttle your entire... So, uh, a couple of different techniques. Uh, uh, one, uh, you can smell them. Two, uh, <laughs> they, they all tend to have incredibly negative feedback on Reddit. Um, but there's, uh, there's also, um, this was an environment, interesting to the question, of um, one very high security about uh, coming into the space, being a participant in that space. There were background checks uh, and you were uh, vetted as a participant, but once kind of inside that walled garden, there were a lot of people with very high permission IM keys, right? They had a lot of sophistication around security. They were rotating keys like crazy people. Uh, I mean, weekly in some cases, but Lots of those keys had probably more permissions than hopefully you are giving to your engineers, right? How many, I'm gonna do this as a straw poll because this stuff pisses me off. How many of you using, if you're using AWS, actual master account keys? Any hands that go up, I'm going to get you. <laughs> so uh, I'm willing to make a bet that at some point, one of you weirdos, put a master key in GitHub. I know because we crawl that thing to make sure. So don't, don't do that. It's bad. Uh, build yourself an IM, reduce rights key, and run around with that. So um, we also uh, we also noticed that there were certain security inadequacies in lots of the systems that we were competing against, um, and so we had some inside views to some of that. You guys remember there were two parts to the talk. Spaceship. Right, no more questions? Oh. Jonathan, if you have a space question, you can ask it. <laughs> I'm afraid this is another election question. Um, you did all this cool stuff for the Obama campaign. If you'd all got a brain parasite and done the same stuff for the Romney campaign, would Romney have won the election? Oh, that's a spectacular question. So. Um, <laughs> It's, it's super important to recognize that, that none of this stuff makes it so that, and in, and in large cases, all of the targeting and the advertising and the communications that happen, an, an, an vanishingly small amount of it is directed at making you think you should vote for someone else, right? Changing minds is, it's way too late, right? Like, you've grown up, I don't care. What I'm interested in is if you like this candidate, you should get off the couch and actually go register and go to vote, right? So a lot of it's about sort of the motivation process of mm, getting people to move. So that, uh, that effort has less to do with, you know, I would think uh, it doesn't matter how good our technology is, right? The, 
um, that motivational process would have been different. You'd have seen maybe a higher turnout on their side, but I think in terms of actual raw numbers, you're looking at us starting to take a long time lead. So, oh yeah. Hi, seeing the projects that you have uh, done and the scale, if one of us was to join Amazon, what projects can we probably look forward to if you were to source South Africans in order to? Sure. So how many of you know that EC2 was invented here? There you go. So it's a relatively big project. <laughs> I, I'll just throw it out there. Uh, both of these systems, um, uh, if you look at the sort of purchasing and consumption curves for primary infrastructure, they don't make blips or bumps, right? So it's just kind of soaked up in the noise of how this system gets used from a scale standpoint. So uh, coming and working at Amazon, you're building the tools that make all of that stuff possible. Pretty, pretty amazing work, pretty amazing work. In either project, are there any notable screw-ups you can share? Oh, yeah. So much broken stuff. So much broken stuff. So uh, I talked about the funky, tiny database behind the CMS for NASA. That was a real bummer. Uh, there was also, um, uh, when we built the, uh, built the whole setup, um, we, we realized at the last minute that we didn't own DNS. DNS was hosted someplace else. Uh, and so we couldn't make any of the kind of normal playbooks that we had around sort of failover in DNS. We should have like kind of done a stack look and go, okay, really, do we own all of the different parts of this deal? Um, we also, uh, we had a, a, a couple of places um, in the, not in the live streaming component, but uh, NASA also uses um, AWS for all sorts of different tools. And they uh, built on top of a system from us called Simple Workflow uh, that's a part of the tool that allows them to write from the Deep Space Network straight to S3. Uh, and the early testing of that um, we were overwriting the same file names, which does bad things, <laughs> such bad things. So, um, so that's, that you do want to inspect and have not just, I think integration testing is the kind of classical term for that, but you should it, create expectations, inspect those expectations, and make sure that what you're building actually does what you think, not just passes all the tests. Um, uh, on the Obama side, I'd say uh, there were a bunch of interesting things that blew up. Um, uh, one of them, uh, Amazon caused. So uh, we had a small scale EBS blip in one of the a uh, AZs. How many of you have heard that before? Um, <laughs> and so, so that, uh, the API for EBS wasn't allowing you to construct new EBS volumes or to take snapshots of volumes. Okay. Um, conveniently, we'd done the game day on EBS outages the week before. So we literally had the complete playbook on what it is we were supposed to do. So Amazon did that one. We terrified them and they ended up having Jim Messina write a letter to Mr. Bezos and that's kind of scary. And so um, that, but that practice, the patterning made them protected not only against their sort of choices, the implementation they made, but also, you know, a lot of these things stand on the shoulders of the shoulders of the shoulders of the shoulders of giants and any of the layers of the stack below you are potentially susceptible and so you want to test at those tiers too. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, so uh, in the lead up to the US elections, there were a bunch of exit polls and kind of people predicting what was going to happen in the election. And the famous guy was Nate Silver who- is a complete genius. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he predicted pretty much every state except one and mm -hmm. he got like a lot of good credit for that. Did you guys make your own predictions? Like was one of the apps that you made like the same type of thing that predicted and how close were you with your predictions compared to him? Sure. Um, so Nate, Nate was totally independent, but he followed the same structural models that our internal tools used. We had to have our own models so that you could do things like targeting advertising to the right places or sending volunteers to the right places. Um, and uh, while we listened to his, we had automation built on ours. And, uh, and we kept sort of truing them up, making sure that we were relatively close and trying to understand where the discrepancies between the two were. Both of our systems called it like it happened, so we feel pretty good about it. But um, it's a great example of the kinds of things you can take into your applications where <coughs> metrics about the performance of your systems allow you to change those systems so that they do not suck, right? Like having that connection 
And that feedback loop does actually make a real difference. You will make different choices because you have those measurements in place. OK, last question here. Hi. I've got a, quite a low tech question yeah. uh, regarding pricing of Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. um, you were telling me last night that it's their stated goal to host every server. We don't um, a lot of startup guys are finding the pricing a little bit prohibitive compared to like Hetzner service, for example. Mm -hmm. Ours are better. I'll be good. Well, really? <laughs> I've, I've heard estimates that like just renting a dedicated server is like three times cheaper. No. <laughs> Thanks. That was the easiest question of the night. <laughs> so uh, so if you're confused on pricing, this is the simple calculator and it makes it super easy. Uh, Amazon, Amazon operates at a scale that is almost impossible to duplicate for businesses other than Neil at the Facebook guy, right? I'm serious. It's really that big. It's many, many times bigger. Uh, if you do not have teams of PhDs optimizing the airflow into your buildings, you probably should stay away from putting your hands on computers. Just saying. <laughs> Um, so Miles actually gave me the choice between these two talks. He said he can do robots in space or Obama, which made me cry. Yeah. And, and anyway, why not both? Yeah. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thank you.